um, Lord Robert Carnwell, judge at the UK Supreme Court. The floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm proud to be here as a representative of the UK Supreme Court and of the common law, and I'm sure that whatever happens in March, on which I express no view, um, we will continue to contribute to and learn from the development of EU environmental law. Um, I've been a member of the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom for seven years. Before that, I was a, a judge for some uh, 20 years, and I've always specialized in environmental law, and I've given a number of judgments on that. Um, also, uh, in the Supreme Court, we are the final court of appeal for a number of Commonwealth countries, particularly in the Caribbean, um, and we give judgments in that capacity as well. Now, in this talk, I, I'm speaking, obviously, in my own capacity, um, not I, as a representative of the United Kingdom or, indeed, in my own court. I express my own views. And I want to focus on two aspects. First, the pact as a tool for judicial decision-making, a concise and authoritative source of recognized environmental principles for use in individual cases, and secondly, more generally, the pact as a framework for the cooperative development by judges, national and international, of what I like to call a global common law of the environment. Now, the first is a very practical point of view. Judges often need to look behind their national environmental laws to the underlying principles to help their interpretation. And we are busy people. Uh, we are looking usually for a concise and authoritative statement, uh, which is so much easier than, and quicker than digging around in a variety of sources of soft law. Now, I don't need to expand on this um, because I've already done this in a judgment in my capacity as a, uh, on appeal from... Trinidad and Tobago, which is one of the countries which still has a final route of appeal to us in London. Uh, this was an appeal by a local environmental group, and they were called, rather attractively, the Fishermen and Friends of the Sea. And they're a very influential group in Trinidad and Tobago and have brought a number of important cases. But this was one in 2017 where they were bringing an action against the government for its failure properly to implement the polluter pays principle in its legislation. And we had the relevant legislation, but I was looking around for a concise statement of the relevant principle as an aid to interpretation, and I found it in Article 8 of the Global Pact. Parties shall ensure that prevention, mitigation, and remediation costs for pollution and other environmental disruptions and degradation are to the greatest possible extent borne by their originator. Very simple and straightforward statement. It didn't, of course, provide the answer in itself. One had to look, look at it through the prism of the national laws. But it certainly helped the interpretation and, in fact, in that case, produce a result favorable to the fishermen and friends. And you can look at it on our website. It's easy to find, 2017 Fishermen and Friends of the Sea. Now, that's one instance, and I'm sure once the pact is adopted, it's a use that we'll be able to make of it in individual cases. But the other factor is, is rather more general, and to some extent for me the pact represents the culmination of a process in which I've been engaged for more than 15 years, indeed along with Luke Leverson, who I first met in about 2004 in um, Nairobi again. Um, and the, that was following the Global Judges Symposium on the Environment, which was formed part of the Johannesburg uh, Summit in 2002. And that was very important because for the first time there was 
global recognition of the importance of judges in interpreting and enforcing environmental laws. And following that, the UNEP, as it then was, set up a working group of judges to try and advise on ways to improve coordination uh, internationally and regionally in the training of judges in environmental law and implementation. And one of our first tasks was to produce a judge's uh, handbook on environmental law, which you will find again still on the UNEP website. And along with Luke, we set up the EU Forum of Judges for the Environment, uh, which is still going. I'm happy to be told by Luke that they've changed the qualification for membership from members of the EU countries to include former members of the <laughs> EU. So I'm sure we'll still be involved in that. I'm very pleased. Um, more recently, uh, Luke and I have been part of a founding team for what we call the new Global Judicial Institute for the Environment, led by Judge Antonio Benjamin of the Brazilian Superior Court. And the plan is to provide a um, platform for cooperation, direct and online, between environmental judges around the world and to provide a judicial portal for the exchange of cases and ideas and, uh, and information on leading cases. Now, to me, the PAC provides a very important way of giving coherence to those sort of cases. Let me illustrate it from one aspect. Um, since the sort of early 90s, judges around the world in different jurisdictions have been struggling with the idea of what one might call environmental trusteeship as a concept, a general duty owed by governments to individual citizens and to future generations and enforceable ultimately through the courts. Um, there was a great case in the Philippine Supreme Court in 1993, the Opposer case, which spoke of rights to a balanced and healthful ecology as basic rights which predate all governments and constitutions and need not be written in the Constitution for they are assumed to exist from the inception of humankind. Now, those splendid words were written in a case which resulted in a successful challenge by 43 children for themselves and generations yet unborn to uh, challenge the government's um, grant of consents to fell in the country's virgin forests. Then in uh, the International Court of Justice in 1997, we had Judge Weir Amantri in the Hungarian Dams case speaking of the first principle of modern environmental law, the principle of trusteeship of earth resources. The Indian Supreme Court in 1997 spoke of the state as trustee of all natural resources which are by nature meant for public use and enjoyment. And more recently in America, in the U.S. District of the Court of Oregon, in the Juliana case, again a challenge brought by um, a group of young people, in that case alleging harm due to climate change and challenging the federal government's failure to take adequate steps to protect it. Uh, Judge Aitken dismissed the government's attempts to have that case struck out, um, and she cited authorities, including the opposer case from different parts of the world, and held that the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to a free and ordered society, and thus, she said, protected by the due process clause of the Constitution and also the public trust doctrine, which is part of American established law. Now, there you get judges from all over the world struggling with the same concept. And it seems to me that it's an enormous advantage to be able to look to a pact, Article 2, duty to take care of the environment, every state or international institution, every person, natural, legal, public or private, has a duty to take care of the environment. Simple, straightforward. And then Article 4, intergenerational equity, present generations shall ensure that their decisions and actions do not compromise the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And so you can go through the pact 
and each of those headings you'll find is expressing an idea which you can find in cases under different jurisdictions in different systems. And I think this is a really exciting chance to put this together and develop in cooperation and through, with the help of the new global institute, these ideas into a truly, as I say, common law system. So um, I was at the launch of the, the pact when President Macron spoke at the Sorbonne in tremendously powerful terms. We also had Arnold Schwarzenegger there, who was, I was rather surprised, but is a great champion of the environment, and he was not entirely supportive of the present American president's approach. But um, there is a real global will, and I think although these principles are not new, we've had the Rio Declaration and a number of statements, they do give a succinct and real form, which I think we as judges will be able to use. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Conrad, for your excellent presentation, so rich in details and examples, and that you agreed to share with us your experience. Thanks a lot.